Hello friends and welcome to this video. So in this video I'm going to talk about this speaker which I'm sh shortly, like hopefully after this video, I'm going to deconstruct. But I thought let's take a moment and share a bit of the things that went correct and nice and went well, really well with this design and the things that didn't. Now this is a Voice of Lancelot derived speaker. So the Voice of Lancelot, if you want to check it out, it is um, Janos actually uh, created it. It's his main system in his living room. It's an active cabinet. It uses um, floor coupling with the base, re uh, base reflex port for, um, for allowing a very different tuning and a cooperation with the room that actually gives you a very high efficiency speaker. And um, I'm using different drivers than him. Uh, it's also an attempt at a corner speaker. Uh, so um, put the voice of Lancelot to a corner speaker and optimize it for that. Um, and it didn't entirely work out. And so for those of you also, this is a hint, for those of you that are always asking, oh, what are the measurements? And, and Janos is cagey about his measurements. No, what it takes to build this speaker is quite a bit of knowledge. Um, insight into what your room does, your room scaling, what it's built out of. Uh, for example, if you have concrete walls and small, you'll have a lot of base reinforcement and you'll have to tune and size your cabinet accordingly. If it's a wood built like here, and I've got a very large room, it's like, um, you know, it's it's like a 10 by six and a half meter room and, and, and quite high, it's different again. And um, some of the things that went wrong actually also had to do with the height. So. That's the reason why those plans are not just available, because you, you, you'll need to elevate your own knowledge to actually do a proper job. And um, now and I'm doing that the trial and error way, and some things of these, of course, worked and others didn't. So I'm going to share it. Hopefully that will be useful for you. And um, yeah, let's get into it. So things that worked about my speaker. First of all, um, having a speaker firing upward and a speaker firing forward is a very nice way to actually prevent um, face cancellations or interference uh, patterns between these two speakers. So that is it ideal? No, there's some dinosaurs too and I'll get to that but um, this is quite a nice way of doing it. Also I must say um, Unlike Janos's cabinet, which has a, an upfiring tweeter that sits on top of the speaker, here it's built in, um, and I've got a woofer um, thing. Now, the one thing that works really well with this speaker is just the ambience compared to live. Because if you imagine that you're looking at a live band and it has some amps, or you have an orchestra, a lot of the sound, once you're in the crowd, actually reaches you via the ceiling because it gets bounced, it gets projected up, and it comes down and you hear it and only the low tones will actually be able to wave around the people in front of you or any objects and so it will be muddled what comes directly and so as you see here the lower range sort of up until one kilohertz comes from here directly that will pass through everything and then the rest gets an even spectrum with these two reflected by the ceiling and I must say it fills the room very effectively so for a mono setup having these two things uh, fire up um, grave a, a new level of ambience for the sound that I'm getting and, and if you heard my recordings previously um, and I moved around a little bit you could have heard that that, that it's a very consistent thing and if you go to a concert by the way and in, in, um, whether that's live because it's always mixed into mono um, or you go to an orchestra and you're sitting, say, in row 20 or uh, below, or you're si sitting somewhere uh, in a posh um, uh, seating area at the back, then you, what you'll have is that, that there will be mono as well. So it, and it's, and it, with the right tube amp, it will actually produce a very nice uh, depth in the, t in the sound and a, um, something that is very akin to life. So, that is what working. Now, what doesn't work? I found previously that my speaker that had the slight tilt actually worked better. Now, I don't know, that might be my room geometry. I've got a, a sloping ceiling there. Um, so I'm not so happy. This was much easier to build than having these uh, ge complicated geometric shapes. Um, but the next time I'm, I'm going to go with a slight incline again. 
So um, I think the last time was at about sort of 15 or 20 degrees sort of um, um, slanted up. Um, what also didn't work with this is something that I hadn't completely overlooked in the design. Now, I'm just going to step back a little bit and hopefully don't trip over anything. What you'll see here is that the length of my cabinet is actually the length to the ceiling. And so I'm getting a resonance in this pipe here, which is it, it's a folded um, uh, transmission line, mass loaded transmission line uh, cabinet. And it's actually the same. So I'm, I'm getting actually a, a resonance in there uh, based on that. It's not that bad, but it is audible. Um, so that's the thing that didn't work. So that's why you see, I think a lot of um, omni, um, omnidirectional speakers actually have always the slanted um, things as well. And that will prevent that the, that the sound is actually directed upwards uh, and bounces back and then um, uh, edge it actually interfere with the sound. So you want it to really direct it away. Um, that actually would be a sloping ceiling, but it still has that re a little bit of resonance in there. So. Um, all the omnidirectional speakers actually have their uh, woofer on an angle. Uh, I would suggest you do the same thing. Um, let's go to something that actually worked. Now, when I built the speaker and chose the wood, I don't really have access to premium woods. They're a long way away here, hours drive, more, not hours, like four or five hours drive away to get to somewhere where they sell uh, better quality plywood. So I had to do it with local, but what I did is just knock on the wood and see how, how it sounded. And one of the things you can hear with this is far more like an instrument. It's, it's actually not bad sounding. It doesn't sound um, weird like MDF and it also doesn't sound that cheap. And I found that having a wood that just has a no, no, nice sound to it, um, a little bit like an instrument, and this sounds a little bit like a drum, um, was a really good um, way of, of, of putting the speaker together. So I felt that um, this speaker with, made with wood that is, um, you know, just good sounding when you knock it, has a real beneficial effect on the, on the cabinet when it starts resonating or it, it starts vibrating, that, it, that it, it's, it just never irritates you because it, it it is it is not a an unpleasant sound by itself it just has a nice uh, thing to it and and uh, the trick is as well I would say with a voice of Lancelot type speaker um, because I've got reasonable big panels here um, don't make it too big um, especially if you have a square square cabinet now my cabinet actually has the divider in the middle so it's very irregularly shaped the front part of the horn and the back part of the horn that sort of goes down um, or the straight transmission line that is actually very has a different shape so I'm, I'm preventing a lot of um, standing waves in the cabinet just by having different shapes on the both of sides um, now um, another thing that didn't work so so that actually the geometry thing worked it, uh, yeah, it's more complex to make, but um, it, it actually um, it has two. It has a nice effect. It's now pulled out. This is a very large speaker. It's about 340 liters, I think, or 360 liters. Um, um, and or it's 340 liters are inside, so it's 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 larger than that. And the the thing is, this shape also works quite well in hiding it in the corner. So. Um, it looks far smaller than the size suggested in if you would have a square speaker of the same um, volume and size. So um, there's that. Now, um, let's see, what else was there? Uh, yes, disadvantage of the transmission line or mass loaded transmission line. Since this is an undamped cabinet, you're getting some resonances in, in the cabinet. Now, I don't know how Janos dealt with it. Uh, or that he just calculated it right, but I found that my bass response wasn't as even as my uh, previous two-speaker setup. If you go back to my, one of my older videos, um, uh, you know, my music clips, you could have seen two speakers. And two speakers have a bit of an advantage because under 100 hertz or maybe under 130 hertz, most of your things that happen with a speaker is partly determined by the speaker and the transmission line can have a lumpy bass output. 
But if you have two cabinets and they're slightly tuned differently, you'll have that the, its quirks start overlapping and evening each other out. Plus then you have the positioning of the room. So the major disadvantage of a, a mono system is really that you only have one positioning. You don't have two positioning. So where you put your speaker in the room has a huge influence on which frequencies get elevated and which gets down. And if you have two speakers, so you have a stereo pair, you have twice the options of a mono pair. And previously I was running mono with two speakers, which were tuned a little bit different. Plus I could give them two locations. Like the options were just higher and and, and, it, and it sounded much more um, tight. The bass was tighter. It, it, it was more sorted. It had quite an even response in the room. Like, um, you know, plus minus 4 dB, probably in a 4 dB range or plus minus 3 dB. Uh, over a whole range from you know about 30 hertz to um, about 13 14 kilohertz or 15 kilohertz so that was quite an achievement and that had to do with both the, the crossover being optimized but also its its position in the room and the angles that are used and how it um, how they work together so and, and and the different tuning so with a single cabinet you just slashed your options by a half um, so if you go the mono way Yes, a single cabinet has some advantages and there's disadvantages, but to me, the two speaker setup sounded better um, and just gave yeah the placement options. Um, final thing, probably. Um, yeah, bass port. So I wanted to try something different with the bass port. And if you know the theory, because it's mass loaded, there is a certain air, a mass of air contained in a port and it has um, uh, becomes a resonator and that enforces the bass. However, when you have a tapered port like that, I thought it would be based on the mass in the port. And you see it's a nice horn shape. So the idea was that it, it, it really nicely propagates the low frequency waves into the room with no sharp edges and just sort of lam in, in, a, in a laminate on the floor, getting the floor boost and, and, and sending it out into the room, especially from a corner perspective. So that's why it was around like that. But I had calculated it based on the mass contained in the port. However, what's, what it ended up with being is a very periodic cabinet. If you see it, it's quite a large scrap still, but there's two woofers, it's a big case. So what happened here is that it actually operated more like the actual, the, the smallest size uh, of the port and, and actually with, it, with, with its length. So it was actually much lower tuned than I thought it was. So it ended up in, I think I had calculated it for 23 hertz, but it ended up being 13.7 hertz. And I could lift the case a little bit and put some things under it and then I could lift it to about 16 hertz or something, but it, it still was completely off. Um, so with base ports, I would say if you're going to establish a taper, which is really good because it prevents uneven harmonics and a, a, a very highly tapered port um, prevents yeah, and, and being quite large has a couple of advantages. So you, you don't, you have very low air speeds you have very low harmonic distortion and the distortion that actually comes is actually on, a, on an even order. So um, it so it won't be audible really. Um, will be measurable but not audible. Um, and the reason is our ear, ca you can't hear um, second harmonic distortion. So it's, it's it, you know, and because our own ear has about 30% distortion. So anything under that is, is virtually inaudible. So that I got wrong as well. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of the things that went right and went wrong with this speaker design. I still think active cabinets have a lot of merit, both in a little bit in efficiency because um, this speaker is um, uh, this speaker is about probably 100 decibels, maybe 101 decibel or something uh, per watt efficient, um, and I even want to increase that a little bit because. Um, just for just to round this out what we're going to do I'm going to chase a little bit more efficiency because it just means if you um, think about amps um, there you've got an experimental amp and there's Millie coming 
So with an amp, um, I have, when the speaker is more efficient, two things happen, very important things happen. More efficient speakers have to have less cone excursion and you need less wattage. Now less wattage means your amp will have far less compromises directed to power and it can have its compromises. It can more focus on quality. You don't have to trade it off for power. Uh, it also has lower amplification. So that may, might mean that you actually can do with less stages, which might allow you to have an all DHT amp, for example. The other thing is that in a dynamic speaker, all of your distortion is quadratically, so cubically, related to the amount of current flowing through um, the voice coil, through, through the voice coil. So that means that if you have twice the current, it means you'll get four times whatever distortion there is. And the types of distortions is compression, because it heats up, starts conducting less, so your signal actually gets compacted. So you get compression, which reduces your dynamics, which means that you get um, less, um, yeah, your peaks will be shallower and you won't get the full dynamics that are in the music. The other one is that all distortion, whether it is because the cone moves out too much out of its magnetic field, the breakup modes in the, in the, in the cone material, um, and even the twisting of the, uh, because of uh, currents, and other losses like eddy current losses and so on. Now some of those can be addressed, but all of these distortion things are um, basically magnify. So when you double it, um, the distortion goes up four times. So that is the basic f facet of a dynamic speaker. So by making your um, whole cabinet more efficient, you can have less current through it, which impacts your source and impacts your speaker. And that's what I'll, I'll be ch chasing. So I hope to make a bit more efficient speaker and um, just hopefully gain a couple of maybe three, four, five, six decibels. And, um, and you know, if I can reach 105 decibel per watt um, efficient at one meter, that would be, or sound output at one meter at one watt, that would be great. And then I can, um, probably go to a simpler amp as well. So that's what I'm looking for in this. And that's the reason why I'm breaking it down. Also the combined with the issues that this was, and I hope that my next design will address it. So if you stuck around, um, thank you for, um, for listening. Um, thank you for my interest uh, in the topics that I have on my channel. Um, please subscribe if you like this type of content and, um, also be, um, if you want me to do more experiments and reviews on components and buy shit, um, you can always uh, sponsor me on Buy Me A Coffee. Any d donation is greatly appreciated. And um, yeah, that's it for now. Have a great day and I'll hope to catch you in the next video. Bye bye.